Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, welcome to today's GIA knowledge session. These are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are based upon the research that GIA has been doing for several decades. At GIA, we're extremely lucky uh, to study and learn from the gems and other materials that we see. And it's our mission uh, to share all of our discoveries and learnings with the world. Uh, I'm excited to kick things off today. My name is Ulrika Danens Johansson, and I'm the Senior Manager of Diamond Research. And today I'm joined with Dr. Mike Breeding, a Senior Research Scientist, and he's going to be telling us about the evolution of laboratory-grown diamonds and their evaluation. Before we get started, just a little uh, details uh, to keep us going. So everyone who is attending uh, has been muted, but if you have any questions at all whatsoever, please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can uh, ask those questions as we're uh, giving the presentation. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation uh, where Dr. Breeding will be able to go through some of the questions that we have received. We'll also send a recording of this presentation to you and uh, the message will also be including a survey so we would love to hear any feedback you may have. And with that I'm going to pass over to Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for attending uh, another of GI's knowledge sessions. We're always excited to, to give you more information and hopefully help you learn a little more about uh, gemstones in general. So as Ulrika mentioned, today I'm going to talk a bit about laboratory-grown diamonds again, particularly how they've evolved a bit through time and history, and have a look at how GIA's uh, reports that we've issued on laboratory-grown diamonds have evolved. We'll also take a little closer look at some of the details and some of the components of those reports. So we were all very excited um, earlier, or a little over a month ago when, when GI announced to, to the world through a press release that we were going to modify our synthetic, or excuse me, laboratory growing diamond grading reports to give specific descriptions for color and clarity. Well, this is something that hasn't been done for a long time at GI, and so it's quite a, a change for us, and it's quite a, a good thing because it provides more information and sheds a little more light to the public on what they're buying. So we're hoping that it helps to ensure the public trust even more. You might say over time that um, the way we've looked at lab-grown diamonds on our reports has evolved, um, much like lab-grown diamonds themselves have evolved. And so if we talk about lab grown diamonds, the obvious word is lab or laboratory. And so I think what most people think about it are, are maybe some mad scientist measuring, uh, filling test tubes back and forth or beakers and magically growing these diamonds in the bottom. And maybe that wasn't that far afoot in the initial thought process. But I think more recently people would think of maybe these bench top uh, furnaces or devices like you see in the lower right, the CVD reactor. But now the whole uh, industry for lab grown diamonds has evolved to the point that more than a laboratory, we may be talking about a factory type situation. Uh, for instance, in the, the two images on the left, you can see just massive numbers of presses. Each one of these is growing a number of lab grown diamonds all at the same time. And you can see if you look through the image just how many of these there are in this factory in China producing lab grown diamonds constantly. So, not only have we evolved from growing these things as in a laboratory, but we've basically turned into a mass production, a factory type regime now, which is, is really kind of cool when you think about it, because in order for science to evolve, be able to grow diamonds so efficiently, so effectively that it makes this cost effective, it's really come a long way. The diamonds themselves are really fascinating. Um, there are two major types of lab-grown diamonds, those grown by HPHT or high pressure, high temperature methods, and those grown by CVD or chemical vapor deposition methods. And here you can see some examples of both. And I think what's striking about these images is just really how spectacularly beautiful some of these stones are. They go from colorless to various colors in pink to red or browns or blues. You can get greens, oranges. What's amazing is how how similar the faceted stones can look like can look despite the differences in their growth crystal shape which are shown underneath these stones you see the hpht stones have quite a different crystal shape 
than the flatter plate light looking CVD, but in the end product is a beautiful faceted stone. So these materials are in the marketplace and it's really important that you understand a little bit about them. So if we look at the history, it's kind of fun to do this because most people don't know much about the history of lab grown diamonds, but if you are familiar with them, you generally think that HPHT lab grown diamonds really came along first, but the reality of it is, is that wasn't the case. The first uh, diamond that was grown in a laboratory that we know of was grown in 1952 by William Eversall, Union Carbide, and it was actually a CVD diamond, believe it or not. But in the 50s, things were really taking off with the growth of diamonds. A year later, a company ASEA in Sweden grows the first HPHD, the high pressure, high temperature diamond. And the year after, General Electric produces sort of small grit HPHT diamonds. And these tiny little diamonds that are used for industrial purposes as abrasives and, and other such. And GE really gets a lot of the credit for growing the first lab grown diamonds, even though as you can see from the timeline that they weren't exactly the first. But in 1954 and the following year, they really caught on. And you started to see headlines, gems grow out of test tube, man-made diamonds, General Electric produces the real thing. I mean, it really caught the attention of the public because for the first time they were starting to see that it wasn't just some imagina someone's imagination that you could create diamonds, they could actually grow them in a laboratory. So all that excitement over a few couple of years and then it took another 16 years before the first gem quality diamond was actually grown and presented and this was also by General Electric and this was really a monumental event because for the first time lab grow diamond went from being a scientific curiosity to actually having an impact in the jewelry industry in the future because now that we could grow gem quality versions well, it took several more years before someone actually did that. In the 1990s, some Russian firms started producing the first HPHT grown lab, di lab grown diamonds for commercial use. Um, all, all the while, General Electric and companies like De Beers and Sumitomo were growing experimental stones, many of which were near colorless. And you can see a, an image here on the right of some of those. So we started to get lab grown diamonds in jewelry and we started to get some colorless experimental products grown. And you notice most of these stones and jewelry are yellow or orange in color. And that's the same thing uh, a few years later when the company Gemesis started producing commercial quantities of these things. So really producing them in a way that can be used in jewelry. Once again, orange and yellow colors. And this orange and yellow colors I'll mention in a bit is from uh, nitrogen impurities in the diamond because there's so much nitrogen in the atmosphere it readily gets incorporated into a, a growing diamond if you don't take steps to avoid that. So that's 2002 and Gemesis is, is starting to make more of these things. Well, the next year, the CVD industry seems to take some steps or at least we started to see the fruits of their research and the Apollo Diamond Company started producing CVD diamonds. Not only CVD diamonds, but CVD diamonds that were facetable and in multiple colors you see here, colorless and sort of pink to red stones. Some of this is a product of post-growth treatment to get the pink to red color, but nonetheless, we were starting to see the CVD industry uh, mature to a point that uh, faceted stones could be generated as well. 2004, uh, we continue this process that Chatham uh, created Gems Company, starts offering HBHT grown uh, lab grown diamonds in a variety of colors. So before we were seeing the yellows, the oranges from the nitrogen, well, they started introducing post-growth treatments. So we get these beautiful pinks and we get some blues and greens. And some of the blues were as grown and some of them are treated. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that when we talk about color, but this was another step in the process because we started to see many more colors, which is really cool because it gives more variety for the consumer. 2008, uh, a company used to be known as Washington Diamonds, now is WD Lab Grown Diamonds, licensed some CVD technology from the Carnegie Institute, a well-known research institute, to really start growing some of their fine colorless CVD diamonds. 2010, Gemesis, the company that I showed you earlier that produced some of the earliest jewelry in HPHD grown diamonds, they decided that the market was in CVD diamonds. And so they started to announce plans that they were going to grow 
large amounts of Coe's CVD diamonds. And maybe hopefully you can see as we've gone along here, what sort of happened is we've kind of zigzagged back and forth. It seems like the technologies are sort of bouncing back and forth. At first, well, the first grown diamond was CVD. Then the HPHT growth really took off. Then the CVD growth advanced. And well, shortly thereafter, the HPHT growth starts to show up again. As a company in 2012, AOTC started producing uh, some very nice near colorless HPHT grown diamonds. And they were faceting them up to just under a, a carat in size, about 80 points in size. So this was a big step. We're starting to see some decent size uh, colorless lab grown diamonds. Well, that all blew up like crazy in 2014 because a company from Russia called New Diamond Technology or NDT started producing very large HPHT colorless diamonds, lab grown diamonds, up to five, over five carats faceted. So the rough, the original crystal would have been much larger. And this certainly caught the world's eye. Here's a New York Times report about that time. Is that rock for real? I mean, people were starting to see these big lab grown diamonds, something that most of us and thought wasn't even possible. And NDT really started breaking barriers and, and showing that you can grow these lab grown diamonds in really large sizes. Well, apparently that rock was for real because the next year NDT showed us a stone that exceeded 10 carats faceted. And not only was this HPHT lab grown diamond over 10 carats, it had an exceptional color, roughly um, E on the GIA scale and very, very nice clarity in the very slightly included range. So we've gone in a few years from marveling at a couple of carats in lab grown diamond to seeing stones that are over 10 carats faceted. And that's just 2015. Well, the CVD market wasn't to be outdone so much. And the next year, we actually um, issued a report on the largest near colorless faceted CVD that we had seen, just over five carats. Very nice in the near colorless range and very slightly included. So another exceptionally beautiful stone showing that the CVD process was capable of producing these larger stones. Well, it just keeps going from there, huh? So then we saw another HBHT lab-grown diamond. This one over 15 carats. The color and the, the clarity were lacking a little bit. They weren't anywhere close to the previous stone that I showed you. But this stone is over 15 carats faceted. It's pretty amazing the way the technology just really has taken off in the last few years and allowed for these much larger stones to be produced. Well, we go big, 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 big. And then in 2017, the diamond industry was kind of taken back a little, I think, because we started seeing tons and tons of HPHT grown melee diamonds, colorless melee. And we'd seen plenty of uh, yellow melee in the past, the industrial type stones. But it was really a big step when a lot of Chinese companies started producing this uh, very nicely near colorless melee. And not only were they producing it, they were producing a lot of it. There were estimates as much as 200,000 carats per month of melee was being produced. It's really an amazing thing. I mean, it triggered a lot of concerns in the industry and a lot of need for identification, but it also shows the technology. I mean, we can grow large stones, we can grow tiny stones, we can grow lots and lots and lots of diamonds. It, it's pretty fascinating. 2018, we saw another, uh, large CVD reported. This time it was at, shown at a trade show. It was over six carats. It was colorless in the very slightly included range. Uh, beautiful, beautiful CVD diamond. We also started to see very nice large colored CVDs. This over five carat intense pinkish orange stone on the right um, came, to, came to the market and came to the light. And we, so we, we see through post growth treatment, they can really introduce some amazing colors into these stones. Well, new diamond technology wasn't done in the same year. We saw a very, very large crystal from them uh, displayed. This stone is the largest one that I'm aware of to date still. It's over 103 carats. Now, granted, it's not the nicest thing to look at, and it's, it is colored. It's yellow. It has nitrogen in it. But you can imagine, even if you took half of this stone and faceted it, how large of a, a faceted stone you would get. So this really is a testament to the way the technology is evolving and the fact that 
things are moving. In 2018, De Beers also threw the, the industry for a bit of a loop because De Beers is traditionally the, the natural diamond producer. Everyone, everyone knows them for their marketing and for their production, their diamond mining. Well, they shifted directions a little and launched their Lightbox line, which is a series of white, blue, and pink CVD lab-grown diamonds set in jewelry. Not only did they go in a direction that wasn't entirely expected by most of the, the trade, but they set a pricing precedent. They started pricing these things at about $800 a carat, which really kind of reset the whole pricing structure of lab-grown diamonds. And so this was a very big deal. There were, a lot went on uh, a couple of years ago and has continued to do so. And so then we start to see fun headlines like this one from the peak. Will we finally say I do to lab grown diamonds in 2018? Well, I think now by 2020, it's pretty clear that we have said I do to them because they're quite readily available, even in um, more commercial jewelry stores and, and availability in the public. So. With that said, before, before you say I do to anything, you really should understand it a little. So I wanted to recap a, a little bit of what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, lab-grown diamonds. Here's a fun scientific chart. This is a, a phase diagram, which is effectively a measure of pressure. So the pressure on the vertical axis increases upward, and thus the depth inside the earth would be equivalently increasing as you go upward. And the temperatures on the horizontal axis increases to the right. So the the equivalent depth in the earth would increase to the right as well. Of course, we're not always talking about depth in the earth, but in this gray oval, this is where most natural diamond grows, about five to six gigapascals in pressure and roughly around a thousand degrees C. So it gives you a reference point. If we wanted to look at a diagram like this, the significance of it is that the white area is where, if you have pure carbon, the white area is where diamond is stable or would grow and the red area is for graphite. So diamond and graphite are both pure carbon. They just have different structures, atomic structures, and that gives them rise to their different, very, very different properties. So if you wanted to go Superman and directly convert graphite carbon or something into diamond, you would have to do that way up here in this orange field. And this is 15 GPA, gigapascals, very high temperatures, 2800 C. It's very difficult to maintain these types of conditions in any sort of laboratory equipment, or at least long enough to grow a stone. So this is not really economically feasible for growing diamond. But what people discovered is, and GE included, when they started growing these things, is that if you add a catalyst or something that increases the rate at which a reaction goes, you can grow diamond at lower temperatures and pressures, much closer to where they grow in nature. And this is where most HPHT lab-grown diamond is created, is in this bluish, blue-green field. So somewhere in the range of five to seven GPA, maybe a little higher cases, and somewhere around 13 to 1500 degrees C. So this is hotter in general than natural diamond growth, but we don't wanna wait thousands to millions of years for our diamond to grow. So by increasing the temperature and the pressure a little bit, we can make those diamonds grow in a matter of days to weeks. And that's, the effective bit of it, but it's in the diamond stability field, the white area. Contrast that with chemical vapor deposition, CVD, which is actually grown down here in this yellow field. And you're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, well, why am I not growing graphite? Well, it's a complicated question, and it's why we say metastable CVD diamond. The cool thing about diamond is once you make diamond, it's very hard to convert it back to graphite. It takes a lot of energy. So if, we're, if you've got a diamond on your hand right now in your ring, you're sitting right down here in the low pressure, low temperature part of the graphite stability field. So that diamond shouldn't be diamond, right? It should be graphite, but it takes too much energy to convert it back, so it stays diamond. The same thing is true in CVD diamond. The reason they can grow CVD diamond in the graphite region is because they've learned how to grow tiny little bits of diamond atom by atom and once you make the diamond to bonds, it's very, very difficult to break them apart. So they stay diamond. And that's the reason that this works. And it doesn't require the higher pressures. Granted, it requires a lot of energy nonetheless. So let's have a quick look at each one. HPHT diamond growth is performed in a press that can achieve those high pressures that are equivalent to a couple hundred kilometers down in the earth. Same as where natural diamonds grow, five to six GPA. And inside that press, 
is this sort of apparatus, a heating cell apparatus that consists of heating elements to get the very high temperatures, about 1,000 degrees, a source of carbon, which is usually graphite or diamond powder, a metal solvent or a flux catalyst. And this is the key bit to let you grow at those temperatures and conditions is having this metal, which is usually iron, nickel, cobalt, titanium, different combinations work. But this area facilitates the growth of diamonds. And I'll explain that in one second. At the bottom, you have a diamond seed crystal. If you want to grow diamond, especially single crystal diamond, you need single crystal diamond for the, for the carbon atoms to know how to bond effectively. So you heat this whole thing up. And not only do you heat it up, but you heat it up more at the top than you do at the bottom, about 20 to 30 degrees hotter up here. And what that does is the heat in general makes the solvent, uh, the metal catalyst melt, and then the carbon dissolves into the metal and it migrates from the hotter temperature down to the lower temperature. It runs into the diamond seed, the single crystal diamond, the structure, it starts to bond and it starts to grow single crystal diamond. And you can see a nice little orange orange version here. And that's the gist of it. The whole thing can take place in a few days to a few weeks, depending on what and how large you're trying to grow. The presses, there are four different types of presses that are mainly used in the industry. I'm only not really going to comment on the details here other than to say that the most common one is the one that you see on the right. And it's called the cubic press. It has six anvils that point in the six different faces of a cube. In the center, you have this entire apparatus that I showed you here, and the pressure is equal in all directions to simulate this pressure deep in the earth. The reason I only show you this press is because this seems to be the press of choice. Companies like New Diamond Technology that are growing the very large lab-grown diamonds are using these presses, and a lot of the Chinese companies that are growing lots and lots of the tiny, tiny melee are also using these presses. So they seem to be the most effective and, and the most efficient at holding the pressure and maintaining the growth regimes that they're interested in. So with that said, have a look at CVD diamond. It's completely different. We sometimes joke that it's like growing diamonds in a microwave because it requires the generation of microwaves to produce a plasma. It's a gas phase chemical reaction. So you introduce various types of gases, one of which needs to be a hydrocarbon gas to provide a carbon source to grow diamond, obviously, since it's carbon. And then we need pure hydrogen gas as well. All this is introduced into a chamber that's kept under vacuum, so below atmospheric pressure at temperatures 700 to 1,000 degrees or so. What happens is the microwaves generate a plasma in which all of these gases dissociate into their associated ions and elements. And so you've got hydrogens bouncing around in here, hydrocarbons, carbon-hydrogen bonds bouncing around. And on the bottom, you have what we're terming substrates here, which are actually diamond seed crystals. Once again, if you want to grow single crystal diamond, it's best done on single crystal diamond. So if we go to the next slide, this is sort of a, an idea of what this whole thing looks like. Over on the right, the nice glowing red area, this is the base, and these are all diamond seeds. These are not red or pink diamonds. Diamond just turns this color when you heat it up. Above it, you see the glowing plasma, which would have all these uh, atomic particles floating through it. On the left here is trying to give you an idea. The bottom, the gray, all the gray atoms are carbon, all the red atoms are hydrogen. The bottom section is the substrate or the seed, and it's in a diamond structure. So the edges of all of these are terminated by hydrogen atoms. And so if you want to add more carbon atoms to the existing carbon atoms, you've got to get rid of the hydrogen atoms. And that's what the hydrogen in the plasma is for. Single hydrogen atoms come down. They, they'd much rather be pairs. So they pluck off one of the hydrogen atoms and it leave an empty carbon spot. And in that empty carbon spot, a hydrocarbon molecule comes down and the carbon bonds to the other carbon in the same manner as the underlying carbon. So you see a pattern. It follows it. I've just grown an atom's worth of diamond. And as I continue, I grow atom after atom, layer after layer, constantly cleaning the surface and adding new diamond. These diamond bonds are so strong, despite the fact we're in the graphite field, they stay as diamond. And so CVD diamond grows very slowly, but very in a very uniform direction, generally upward layer by layer. So you see there's a huge difference, but in the end, you get the same type of, of lab-grown product. There's some differences, certainly, but they can both make very beautiful gemstones. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about GIA and the way that we've done reports with lab-grown diamonds. And so I take you back to the timeline. And I, this is really funny. As I was putting together this presentation, I ran across something that took me back to this part of the timeline, when GAE produced the first experimental gem quality diamond in 1970. So this had to be a, a monumental event. You know, I mean, for the first time, there's a, a lab-grown diamond that's big enough to cut into a gemstone. And so I was looking through GIA's archives, and I found an old GIA report from our New York laboratory, and it's dated in June of 1971. And this is a report on a transparent, near colorless, round, brilliant diamond. And it was a lab-grown diamond, a synthetic diamond, about 30 points in size. And with a little research, I went back and re discovered that this is a general electric diamond, one of the first ones that they ever grew was sent to GIA. As the foremost authority in diamonds and gemology, we issued a report on one of the very first one of these things grown. It's really amazing. And it was a very nice stone, a very good color and clarity. So with that said, uh, we went a long time before we actually issued more reports. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. I, I threw this in here just so you could get an idea. This is not the exact stone, but this is roughly what the stone would look like. Similar color, clarity, and size, and cut. So it was a very beautiful stone, even early on. So it wasn't until 2007, 2008, that GIA started issuing more formal, we call them synthetic diamond reports, because we were using the term synthetic then rather than lab-grown. Synthetic simply means uh, something is produced in a laboratory and instead of nature. Um, there are all sorts of synthetic gemstones. But a few years ago, the FTC decided that uh, the term was not misleading, but it was confusing to the public. People associated the term synthetic with simulant. And a simulant is not an actual diamond. It's a material made to look like a diamond. So from that point on, we've kind of skewed toward lab but I'll show you that as we go. The first reports here are obviously different and nice glowing yellow backgrounds on them and the bottom. We really wanted to emphasize that these reports were different. These were lab grown stones and not natural diamonds. If you look closely at the information, I highlighted a few things here to give you an idea. We called it a synthetic diamond grading report. We identified it as laboratory grown with a comment that said, this is a man-made diamond and has been produced in a laboratory. And one of the big things that we did was for the color and clarity, we actually uh, issued ranges. So rather than letter values, we said colorless for the colorless range, near colorless and so on. And likewise for the, for the, I'm sorry, for the color, for the clarity, we did something similar, very slightly included instead of a, a VS1, VS2 type grade. And so this was, this was uh, a bit controversial. I mean, uh, People who deal in lab-grown diamonds weren't particularly happy. People deal in natural diamonds maybe were happier, were not entirely happy that reports were being issued, but this just is the beginning of GIA's reporting on them back in 2007, 2008. Well, we went for a while doing this, and then in 2014, we updated the reports, but rather than change a whole lot, we more changed the style. You notice now it doesn't have that glowing yellow color, still a little bit different from natural, but we're still looking at a GIA synthetic diamond report from 2014. Very similar properties, laboratory grown, man-made man diamond grown in a laboratory, and color and clarity ranges rather than specific description. Well, just last year, we updated our reports again, and this is in response to those FDC guidelines that I mentioned. So we started, the, the style is very similar, you see, but we changed a few things. So we now started calling them the GIA Laboratory Grown Diamond Reports. Once it's still identified as laboratory grown, but we gave a little more information in our comment. And I think this is, as things have evolved with time, this is part of the evolution of the report, is now we're, we say this is a man-made diamond produced by CVD or HPHT growth processes. And it may include post-growth treatments to change the color. So there's two big things there. For one, we started specifying the different types of growth. And we, this is more for education of consumers. We want them to know that there are two main types of lab-grown diamonds. We're not specifying which one you're dealing with versus the other, but you should know that there are names. If you see CVD or HPHD, we want you to understand that's what it is. Um, 
but we continued with the color and the clarity ranges. So, and this, like I said, this is sort of where the evolution goes along. You know, one thing I, I want to back up and mention is through all this time, we inscribe our stones with laboratory grown. And this is really important for disclosure. That's something that really hasn't changed over time. And it's a really important part of the, of the report process is that this disclosure is put onto the stone itself. So having backtracked now, I'll go back. So this was just last year, as I mentioned. So now part of the reason that we're doing this webinar is to help introduce you to GI's all new LGDR, our laboratory grown diamond report. We have this fun splashy blue screen here, and I'm happy to tell you that these are gonna be available very soon. In, in mid-October, the plan is to roll the service out. And, and it's so exciting that I got a nice coming soon image for you here rather than a report because we really, when we roll this out to you, we really want to have it be fun, have it be an impact. But you know what? I am going to steal a little information and, and give you a little bit of information here. These all new LGDRs, lab grown diamond reports, they're a complete report redesign. And not only is it redesigned, but it's going digital only, which is really cool. It's sort of an evolution to the modern world. Everyone has their phone, their tablet. And this is where we really see the, the diamond industry and the report industry heading in some capacity. And so we're, we're going that way with these lab grown reports. And we're also introducing a dossier version. So those of you who do grading reports from GIA are familiar with smaller stones getting dossier reports. And so we wanted to make that available uh, for lab grown uh, stones as well. These new these new reports are going to have a full four C's assessment, meaning you're going to get color, you're going to get care weight, you're going to get clarity, and you're going to get cut. It's, it's really a cool thing. And not only that, we've added the letter descriptions, the letter specifications for color and clarity. So no more ranges, no more guessing where the color and clarity fall in the range. We're, it's just going to be, we're going to spell it out for you directly. Each one of these is going to have their own custom landing page for the report. Since it's digital, it's easy to do and really customized to the stones. And it's really cool because it gives you extra educational information. So, like I said, these are, should be available in mid-October. Um, it's exciting. There'll be four different formats. You'll hear more about that from GIA in the coming couple of weeks uh, as they're released. So, I highlighted little highlights on all the other reports, so I figured it's only appropriate that I do so here. So we've got the new heading, the new fancy heading, and then some stuff that you can't see, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little sneak peek of this box. This is where the specific color and clarity descriptions are, and it's really, really fun, and it's exciting because for the first time, or at least the first time since 1970s, we're going to give specific uh, descriptions of color and clarity. We're continuing with the same comment that I read to you from last year, specifying the two different types of growth and talking about post-growth treatments. And this is something I, I didn't mention on the previous slide, but why did, why did we put the comment about post-growth treatments? Well, it, it's another interesting topic in the trade because natural diamonds, if they're treated by various processes of radiation or high pressure, high temperature annealing, their value is, is predicated upon that treatment because the rare stone that comes naturally with a color is rarer than a stone that's treated to a particular color. Well, the same uh, approach hasn't really been adopted much in lab-grown diamonds, and a lot of the trade doesn't seem that familiar with the fact that some lab-grown diamonds are subjected to post-growth treatment. For instance, most of those uh, pink and red stones that I showed you earlier, those are directly a product of of treatments that occurred after they're grown. So we wanted to put this comment on here to educate the public to say that you may have post-growth treatment here. We're not gonna say what it is or specify because the public doesn't really care right now, but they should know that it can happen. And so we wanted to make that clear. So the first part that we modified was color. And I wanted to, being a, a person who works on diamond defects and how that affects their color, I couldn't get away without talking a little bit about the science. So these are simplistic diagrams of a carbon lattice and diamond. You can see an array of carbon atoms here bonded in a diamond structure. They produce no color. You have a colorless diamond. If you substitute a boron atom in for one here and there, you can get a blue color. If you substitute single atoms of nitrogen, which is the most uncommon impurity in diamond, you get a yellow color. Over time in the earth, 
um, under heat and pressure, these nitrogen atoms will move around the lattice and sometimes they come together in this and other configurations. But the basic ones, the type 1AA, the pairs and the four nitrogen atoms, which I'm not gonna show you here, they also produce no color, which is sort of interesting because you go from a yellow color with singles to no color when you put them together. But it just has to do with the way that light absorbs. What's even more interesting is you can get this entire range in natural diamonds, but you do not get these aggregated nitrogen colorless lab-grown diamonds. And you might say, well, why is that? It seems like it should work the same way in nature, right? You get heat, you get pressure, that sort of thing. Well, the reason is kind of explained in this diagram. We think all diamond grows with single nitrogen impurities, both natural and in the laboratory, if nitrogen's available. So if you put heat and pressure in nature, these nitrogen atoms will join up and pair up and they'll stay that way until all of the single atoms or pretty much all of them are pairs or more complicated aggregates. At that point, the color is gone. But because of the higher temperatures that we use to grow lab-grown diamond, as you aggregate these nitrogen pairs, at the same time you break up nitrogen pairs and make single nitrogens. So it's this crazy sort of ping pong effect back and forth between the two. So you can get some aggregated nitrogen in lab-grown diamonds, but you will always have single nitrogen as well. And it takes very, very little single nitrogen to produce yellow color. And thus, you will not get um, aggregated colorless lab-grown diamonds. It's really just a neat fact, um, but it's a very useful fact. That's why lab-grown colorless diamonds are type 2, type 2A or type 2B, depending on how much boron they have in them. So most color in diamond is of the yellow hue. You're familiar with GI's D to Z color grading system and then beyond that, the fancy colors. So as you increase the amount of whatever impurity is causing color, you tend to, in, to uh, further along the letter grades from D, which is colorless, toward the Z, which is light yellow or fancy. Well, in nature, most of the time that aggregation process produces other defects called N3 defects, which uh, absorb light in a way to make small amounts of yellow color. And that's what this gradation you see is in natural diamonds from these nitrogen N3 aggregated defects. Coincidentally, this N3 is the same thing that produces the blue fluorescence that we see in a lot of natural diamonds. And we sort of think of it as characteristic in many ways. That's not what happens in lab-grown diamonds because you can't do the progressive aggregation and create the N3 defects by normal processes. So what you're seeing with the color, the color descriptions in lab-grown diamonds is an increase in the single nitrogen concentration for the most part. So increasing in C centers. As you add more, you slowly in, uh, change the color letter grade from D, or the letter description, excuse me, from D toward the Z or the fancy range. So it's same effect, same hue of color in general, but a different mechanism. You also get some brown uh, DZ grades in natural diamonds. And uh, coincidentally, in CVD lab grown diamonds, there's also a brown scale where you can go from D to Z. Unlike, well, actually, this one's very similar because in natural diamonds, it's often due to vacancy clusters, which are clusters of lots of defects, which cause absorbed light to produce the brown color. CVD can also have these vacancy clusters. In fact, it's much easier to grow CVD diamond as a brown color. It's much faster, much more economical. What's really cool in the, in the lab grown industry and part of that evolution as well is that they learned that we can grow it faster this way. We can then post growth treat it or process it and decolorize it and make it near colorless. So there is a brown color range, but a lot of the color CVD you see in the industry, quite a lot actually, I mean, more than three quarters of it at some points, based on statistics, has been produced by this treatment process to decolorize it. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of the range of how colors come about. So you can also add boron into the growth chamber. Most commonly this is done in HPHT grown diamonds, but the more boron you add, you go from something that still looks colorless with very tiny amounts of boron. But once you get over about 100 parts per billion boron, you start to get nice blue colors. And then of course, just like with natural diamonds, you can treat them by irradiation or irradiation and heating. You can add green, blue, pink to red colors. 
depending on the starting uh, impurities in the lab-grown diamonds, you can produce pretty much any color that you want if you know what you're doing. So there's a whole rainbow of colors available in both types of lab-grown diamonds through uh, as grown techniques and post-growth treatment. So another interesting part, particularly of HPHT grown diamonds, is if you've, you've heard us talk about these before, you've heard us say cube octahedral growth, meaning they grow with a mixture of cube uh, faces and octahedral faces, whereas most natural diamonds grow with just octahedral faces, or dominantly at least. One of the cooler things is if there are impurities present, they go differently into these different growth sectors. So in this instance, you see a cube growth sector, which has nitrogen in it, causing it to be type 1B. You see octahedral growth sectors with, that are blue because they have boron, because boron prefers to go into that growth sector. And then you've got intermediate growth sectors between the two that have no color at all. They didn't really take much nitrogen or boron. So you get this combination of colors. And some of the companies, including, uh, I think the earliest one was the Chatham Synthetic Gems Company, even grew some of these intentionally with the yellow and the blue blending together to give you an as grown face up green appearing diamond. It's really amazing and just from the color zoning. But this color zoning is something you can see if you immerse the diamond in methylene iodide or preferably something like water, which is a lot less, less harsh and toxic. So just a little tidbit, you can see down the lower right an example of that is yellow and then the middle is a pink treated stone and then a blue uh, boron rich as grown stone at the top. So just a, a fun tidbit. So now we move on. The other thing, the other description that we're changing is, is we're giving specific values for clarity. And this is something that's familiar to most. The GI's clarity grading scale goes from flawless or internally flawless down to included. And there's a series of uh, different uh, numbers along with those letters. And this really sort of pegs diamonds in particular ranges. Most of these clarity features that cause the differences between uh, the descriptions are from inclusions. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about how inclusions in diamonds form. Um, the, or in the earth, you have minerals growing as different grains. And these diamond, as a diamond grows, it gets larger and it oftentimes incorporates these existing mineral grains. Then when a kimberlite magma picks the diamond and rushes it up to the surface, it brings up the inclusion in the diamond. And these inclusions, they're not the best for the gem industry because they reduce the clarity and make it less desirable. They're fascinating for the science industry because it gives us a glimpse of what this deep earth looks like in ways that we can never see otherwise. Well, it's not that dissimilar in a lab grown process. Here's an HPHT reactor. And I kind of modified this to show you that as a lab HPHT grown diamond grows, sometimes it incorporates small amounts of this molten metal flux and those get preserved as inclusions within the diamond and so thus those affect the clarity. We'll look at some examples real quick. These are natural diamonds with beautiful beautiful crystals along the bottom, uh, garnets and clinopyroxenes. Then you see other types of natural inclusions like oriented needles, uh, sulfide crystals which I'll show you more of on the next that are sort of dark and metallic looking. Twinning wisps, which are related to differences in the growth orientation as the crystal forms. And then these etch channels, which are a result of dissolution as the diamond is growing and due to sort of slight weaknesses in the structure. So all of these are characteristic uh, inclusions of natural diamonds. I said I mentioned sulfides. Sulfides are kind of fun because they're, these are the, the inclusions in natural diamond that most resemble what you see from the metal flux in lab-grown diamonds. They're shiny, they're metallic looking, but because of the way that they expand differently than a diamond host as they come to the Earth's surface, almost always you'll have these large fractures around them that are filled with graphite. And this really kind of sets them apart. Sulfides are very favored inclusions among geologists because there are elements in here that are radioactive and decay with time. And if you measure them in very precise amounts, you can actually date diamond growth. And it's really one of the only ways to do that reliably. So they're, they're quite popular amongst uh, scientists who study diamonds. So if we look at the equivalent in HPHT lab-grown diamonds, we see these crazy looking irregular rod-shaped bits of the metallic flux 
that catalyst material that's helping us grow at lower temperatures and pressures, consisting of things like iron, nickel, or cobalt. But they take on these very often take on these drippy, irregular looking rod like shapes. They're very distinctive. They're metallic and reflective, but they're very different than natural diamonds. Here's some more examples, a nice long rod like inclusion here, uh, various examples through here. Um, the one in the lower right, I always find fun. It's just crazy to think how something like this forms. You've got a bit of the diamond crystallography imposed on part of the inclusion and the rest of it being rod like. The one in the lower middle is fun too. It's sort of bulby bits of metal in there, but there must be some nitrogen association with, with a bit of the, of the flux, the catalyst that got trapped because you see these color zones, these yellow color zones associated with some of the inclusions, which suggests that there's more nitrogen in that area than elsewhere. So those are some examples of the flux inclusions. If you get enough of these metal inclusions, occasionally you can even attract a lab-grown diamond to a magnet which is pretty, pretty amazing thing because to think of how much metal you need in there to, to attract to a magnet, it's quite a lot. Now, just because a diamond doesn't attract to a magnet doesn't mean that it's not lab grown. But if it does, you can be very, very sus suspicious that that's the case. Another type of inclusion that affects the clarity are these sort of sparse pinpoint inclusions. Uh, I don't like to use the term cloud because they're kind of uh, sparsely distributed, but they're very distinct pinpoints throughout the crystals. They're more common than the yellows and the blues of the HPHT grown diamonds. We do get clouds in natural diamonds, but they're very different. They're more wispy and more concentrated generally than these are. We also see some graining patterns that can be reported in lab grown diamonds. Often it's referred to as hourglass graining because you have sort of edges that resemble the sides of an hourglass. This is due to the intersection of growth sectors you have cube growth sectors and octahedral growth sectors adjacent to each other. And that's what causes this sort of graining pattern that you can quite commonly see in colored uh, HPHD lab grown diamonds. CVD diamonds, on the other hand, are not as generous with their inclusions. They don't have this metallic flux to trap uh, in that same capacity as you might see natural diamond trap mineral inclusions. But they do occasionally have non diamond carbon inclusions. So these black, uh, ugly little wispy things that are just uh, a detriment to clarity in general, but they're not really that common. Um, they get incorporated as part of the growth process. Sometimes they'll be radial around fractures. Sometimes if you have multiple stages of growth in a CVD diamond, you'll get layers that'll be concentrated, like this one that'll have more of these dark inclusions. Sometimes there are tiny little bits of them preserved in a faceted stone near the culet or maybe near the girdle where they're hiding out. Oftentimes they're not present at all. Every once in a while, you'll even get some graining in a CVD diamond, like this parallel brown graining you see on the right. This brown is likely due to some sort of vacancy clusters or non-diamond carbon concentrations, probably along areas where the growth of the diamond has been stopped and then started again in multiple stage growth. So with that, I leave you with this, this last picture, which is a, just to give you an idea. These are all fairly large HPHD colorless diamonds that have been grown in the last few years. You can really do amazing things now. We're hoping that the introduction of our LGDR, our lab grown diamond reports at GI in the next couple of weeks will, will really help, help the industry and help to, to give the, the consumer a better understanding of what they're buying. So thank you for your attention. And, Happy to take any questions now. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Um, so we've been getting lots of very interesting questions uh, about uh, this new report. So firstly, is this uh, GI lab grown diamond report made for any other uh, synthetic gem materials? Uh, you mean non-diamond materials, I assume? Exactly. So GI has, um, different report options for other colored gems. But no, these, these reports that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks in issuing are just for diamonds. They're, they'll work for colorless diamonds, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, larger than 15 points in size. And colored diamonds, there are options pretty much any size. And grading, uh, grading report style is above 15 points, but I think you can do uh, color and origin type reports that are smaller. But no, just for diamonds right now is where we're making the change. Thank you. 
And uh, since, since this new uh, lab-grown diamond report is going to be purely digital, um, they are asking how is the jewelry or the consumer able to check that the report exists? Will it come with a card or some sort of paper, or is there some other method of checking? You know, that that is a good question and one to which I'm not sure I have an answer right now, but I can guarantee you, you will have an answer within the next couple of weeks. The, the digital version of the report is, I know, is going to be designed so that it's viewable on mobile devices quite well or a, a PC. Um, my understanding is that there uh, are going to be digital document versions available as well, but I don't want to speak too much to that because being a scientist, I'm not particularly involved on the distribution side. So I, stay tuned is what I'll say. Of course. Well, uh, one thing to emphasize is that when it comes to any GI report, whether it's lab grown or other, uh, we do have a function called report check online. It's so it's yep. always possible to log on and just input the report number and you will find all the details there. So that's a good way of verifying that the um, report exists. Good point, Ulrika. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important aspect of, of this whole thing. And there's a little bit of a confusion uh, regarding the fact that we say that they could be either CBD or HPHD synthetics. So uh, could you please confirm that we are able to test and separate these two um, lab-grown diamond materials? And also the question is uh, how, long, how come is it that we only um, give a general description and we don't say whether it's CBD or HPHD? So once again, I, I'm going to answer this as a scientist, so keep that in mind. But as scientists, yes, so GIA and our research and identification groups are capable of telling which type of diamond. And if you've, if you've tuned into previous webinars and other presentations we've given, you know that we, we talk to you about different characteristics of each type of growth. I didn't go into a great bit of detail now, but yes, it's possible to tell the difference. And the question of why they're not getting issued on the report, my understanding is that um, we don't really think that the consumers are that interested in that information right now. The key thing, key interest in the trade is, is my diamond natural or is my diamond grown in a laboratory? It's possible in the future that GIA will revisit that idea and make available that information, but I'll have to defer that to um, more of the, the managed, senior management of GIA as to when and if that may come. So I can't give you a, an answer to if, but no, it will not be included on the reports that we're going to be issuing in the next couple of weeks. Yes, of course. And, and this is just trying to ensure that there is, is a little confusion for the uh, general buying public. They know that it's a laboratory grown diamond, but they may not be necessarily interested in specifically what type of uh, lab grown diamond it is. Yeah, I mean, with disclosure... Uh, it, oh, sorry, one more comment. With disclosure issues, it's really important right now that we really establish that the trade know whether they're getting a natural diamond or a lab-grown diamond. The rest is sort of ancillary information, so. Um, I've also received the question about uh, provenance. So uh, will it be possible for um, customers potentially to uh, say specifically which uh, lab it has been grown at? Is that something that GIA would consider in the future? Uh, I can't speak to whether we would ever consider it, but it certainly, to my understanding, is not a consideration right now. We're only offering that surface for natural diamonds. And then, um, finally, uh, I have questions about the material itself. Uh, so I yeah. know that you have uh, done presentations previously that are available uh, as, as part of the GIA Knowledge Session series about the distinction of HPHD and CVD diamonds. Um, one, one of the questions, however, that, that they're asking is how long do they take to grow? Well, part of that depends on how big you want to grow them. So obviously, the bigger you, you grow the diamond, the longer it takes. In general, uh, you're talking days to weeks. I mean, it's hard to really maintain the instrument conditions pressure and temperature or even the gas and the operating conditions of, of in the case of CVD for longer than that amount of time. Um, they've adapted techniques to grow bigger diamonds in CVD world. They start and stop the growth so that they can bring the conditions under control better. I mean, Ulrika, maybe you have more to comment on this even, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, generally days to weeks, I think is the safe, right? Exactly. That, that's, that's also my, my understanding. Um, so, 
the, the vast majority of, of the stones are going to be in the order of days to weeks. And it's only sort of unusual experimental stones where they're trying to reach some sort of a, a record size uh, where they'd uh, go for longer than that. In a G, I mean, at GIA, we, we have uh, facilities. We, we grow CVD diamonds for research purposes, and we, we see similar results to, to what we're talking about. So it really is it's a tested thing. We know how long it takes to grow them. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's also been a couple of questions about the seeds that are used for growth, so either the substrates for CVD-grown uh, diamonds or HPHD-grown diamonds. Um, could you clarify what type of uh, material they need to use for a seed? Could it be a natural diamond, a lab-grown diamond? Uh, could it be some other material? So to grow high-quality single crystal diamond, you tend to have to use high-quality single crystal diamond. To simplify it, I always like to, as I discussed in the, in the talk, I say the, the carbon comes down, it sees a diamond structure, it's a whole lot easier for it to mimic that structure and grow the same way. Now, that being said, you can grow on any type of diamond you want, be it natural, be it another lab-grown diamond, HPHD grown or CVD grown. But one of the, the factors that has to weigh in uh, are the amount of defects that are within the stone. So defects, which are uh, perturbations in the structure, imperfections in the diamond lattice, they can propagate from your seed up into your crystal and cause all sorts of problems with the quality of the growth. So generally people like to use very high quality seeds so that they can grow very high quality material. Um, most seeds are lab grown. I mean, natural diamonds are very expensive and rare and therefore people tend not to, to grow on it. Um, usually, I, I'm not sure if there's a preference in it. I know there are a lot of CVD seeds used and I know there are a number of companies that have produced HPHD grown seeds as well and sliced the crystals to make seeds. So. I already got on it's one preferred over the other these days or uh, sorry, excuse me. It, it, are lab grown HPHT seeds preferred over lab grown C V D seeds or is it just kind of a mix and match what's available? It's a mix and match. It it depends with the what's available. Certainly for the C V D uh growth method, they want to have the largest seed possible in order to grow the largest uh sure. stone. Um so some, some of them will be growing CVD diamonds and then slice those and use those for seeds, whereas others might have contacts and access to HPHT material. Uh, generally, the HPHT material produces better seeds for um, CVD growth, uh, but they are interchangeable. So, yeah, so you can grow diamond on any other single crystal diamond, but most is done on lab-grown seeds. Exactly. And it just just has to do with availability of the material and the, and the cost associated with the uh, with the seeds available. Just just uh, to point out, to quickly point out, they they can reuse their seeds quite often though. So so they yeah. cut them off of the the new crystal and polish them back down and reuse them. So it's not a one time consumable type situation. Uh, I'm also receiving a question about uh, cremation diamonds. Uh, is this the type of stone that we would be uh, grading as part of the service? Uh, I don't think GI has any restrictions on on cre cremation diamonds. I mean, if, for those of you who might not know what this is, um, there are companies out there that advertise that they will take um, uh, ashes, cremation uh, remains from a loved one or loved uh, pet or something like that, and use them as part of the carbon source, sprinkle them in, and grow a diamond with them. Um, I, I, we we're to my understanding, we don't put any special comment and we're, that's not really an option, but we certainly would uh, provide a report on a diamond like that, just the same as any other lab grown diamond. Exactly, thank you. Um, and then just, just to reiterate, um, how can a, uh, a, a member of the public or, or uh, one of our uh, customers uh, just do a quick verification of a uh, what material they have, whether it's lab grown or natural. Uh, so I know that you were uh, showing lots of inclusion images uh, to help with the separation of the two, but what about uh, screening equipment? So there are a lot of uh, portable screening devices in the trade right now, and they all have different advantages and disadvantages. Unfortunately, that's another hour long webinar unto itself probably, but um, there are resources out there um, if you, 
go to the the DPA, the Diamond Producers Association website. I think it's still available, right? The Project Assure data is publicly available. It's yep. a test that was done uh, across all of the the then available devices, testing them for their ability to detect uh, natural stones, synthetic, uh, excuse me, laboratory grown stones, um, and that sort of thing. And so just uh, Google Diamond Producers Association Project Assure, and you'll get uh, a link to those results, which will tell you a little bit about each of the screening devices that are available. Uh, and then uh, with a diamond testing pen, would they, would they pass or refer? So you have to be careful with a, a diamond tester. There are a couple of generations of diamond testers. The older ones uh, focused largely on thermal conductivity, as I remember. And they, and then when moissanite came along, synthetic moissanite, it really caused problems because it would test as diamond. And so the newer pins do both thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity. So in most cases, you get a good reliable result as whether you're dealing with a diamond or not. But don't assume that you're going to, that a result on a lab grown diamond versus a natural diamond is going to be good because in many, many cases it will not be reliable. So there are even cases, believe it or not, where a lab grown diamond with a little bit of boron in it will test as moissanite. So I don't recommend the use of, la of, of gem testing pens or gem testers to separate natural from lab grown diamond. Okay, thank you. And what are the difficulties that, that the growers face when it comes to uh, producing the larger sizes? Why is it that HPHD grown diamonds are oftentimes larger? Well, uh, this may be a question you can answer better than I can, but the in, inside the press, um, you have more of a confined system and you don't have all sorts of fluctuating gases and things. The big constraints on HPHT grown diamonds are the size of the cell and your ability to maintain the pressures and temperatures for long periods of time. CVD is a little more complicated because it's a slower growing technique, but it also is very, very sensitive to the state of the plasma and all of those atoms that are bouncing around and thus the flow of the gases. And so as you do that and your diamond grows, it it gets hotter sometimes because it'll get closer to the plasma. So you have to maintain the position of the stone, of the, the growing crystal. You have to monitor the gas flow and you have to maintain this high amount of energy. So in general, HPHD growth is easier because it's contained. But I think the reason that you get larger stones is because it's just a function of learning to make bigger cells and just let your presses run longer. So maybe that's a little simplistic, Ulrika. If you have more to add, please do. No, I think that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, sorry, just going through the, the last few questions here. Uh, are we able to, um, uh, at GIA, are we able to separate uh, laboratory grown diamonds and natural diamonds even in mounted pieces? Uh, in, in general, I would say yes, that's not a problem. Um, uh, there are certain tests that we run uh, using spectroscopy equipment. Sometimes it's difficult to do with um, a stone that's mounted, particularly if it's mounted in a setting with other types of gemstones. One of the one of the key analyses that we do is called photoluminescence, where we shine a laser on a gemstone and measure the light that comes off, and it tells us a lot about very small amounts of defects in the diamond structure. And in order to do this, you have to cool the diamond to very low temperatures. Diamond has a fantastic uh, thermal tolerance, and so it doesn't break when you do this. Other gemstones, not so much. So if you have a diamond mounted in a ring and you need to do this type of testing, then you wouldn't be able to do it because you'd risk the other stones. But I would say that vast, vast majority, probably 90 plus percent, 95 plus percent of the mounted stones, we'd have no problem determining. Mm -hmm. Yes, and sort of uh, linking back to that, one of the devices, the screening devices that GIA um, cells, the ID100, that one can be used to at least screen for mm -hmm. uh, synthetic lab-grown diamonds in mounted or loose goods. And it's very, very simple to use. And that's something that's available to the trade as well. Very effective too, yes. Yeah. And then um, finally, uh, will the new lab-grown diamond report have uh, plots on them? That's a good question. And the answer is it, there are four different varieties. 
Um, so much like the natural grading reports, certain ones have plots and others don't. The laboratory uh, grown diamond report, the base report will have a plot. Uh, the uh, features that are marked on the plot are not necessarily going to be reported in the exact same way. For instance, uh, I'm not going to, if you have a, a bit of crystal surface left on your diamond, it's not going to be called a natural. It's going to be called mm -hmm. crystal surface and things like that will potentially refer to growth remnants that are products of the lab laboratory growth. But yes, the, the clarity features will be marked on at least that report. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I, I don't, dossier report does not get a plot. The colored diamond uh, report that involves grading would certainly get a plot, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the color report would not get a plot. So I think yeah. two of the four will have plots if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, yeah, I, I have them in front of me. And, oh, and thank you. Right. Yeah, so, I don't. So, <laughs> so two, two of the four will, will uh, contain plots. So it'll be very similar style to what you're used to for natural reports. I mean, we've made, we've taken steps to, to make sure they're clearly lab grown and designated as such, but the style I think is going to be much closer. So. Exactly. And uh, just again to re reiterate for everyone, it, it'll be abundantly clear on the report that it, that it's about a laboratory grown material and that it is different to a natural stone. And the diamonds will continue to be inscribed for all four report types with laboratory grown on the girdle. Exactly. So it will be possible to uh, check that using just a simple loop. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and for all those excellent questions. If you have any other questions at all, please find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. As we mentioned at the start of this presentation, uh, we will be sending you a link that has uh, a copy of this presentation for you and also feedback form. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope that you can join us next week. Next week, there's going to be a presentation by Aaron Palkey. That's okay. I think it's a tag team between Nathan Renfro and Aaron there Palkey. There we go. Yeah. The, yep. Sapphires. Yeah. Sapphires of Montana. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.